Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations, where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be from their inception, ideas on the page, through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. I'm David Smith, SDSA, and joining me are set decorator Jan Pascal, SDSA, and production designer Francois Agui to talk about their collaboration on the wonderful little film Air, which is currently streaming on Amazon. Hello, Jan and Francois. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Nice to see you both again. Um, Jan, we know a lot about you. Is there something that you can tell us that we don't know at this point about how you got your beginning, how you got started? Started in Pittsburgh. Mr. Rogers was my first job and came through theater and was lucky enough to get out here in the 80s and been plugging away ever since and fortunate to work with people like Francois along the way. What was your first non-union show and what was your first union show? My first non-union show, I was the paint bucket scrubber on uh, the paint crew on Creep Show. It was a George Romero horror film that's quite taken on a world of its own, that and Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead was my first big decorating non-union job, a zombie movie that's become a cult classic. Um, and my first union job was uh, we were on a show called Arizona Dream that turned union. That's how I got in. Um, no one ever saw that movie. Um, <laughs> and then we got a series called Viper at Paramount. And that was our first big union job. And, and Francois, how did you get your start? I worked in visual effects for a visual effects supervisor named John Dykstra on a movie on Batman Forever. And uh, and that was kind of my film school. And I, dis, I I was in the art department a lot. I was kind of the glue between visual effects and the art department. So I got to see how much fun they were having. And I was like immediately, I got to get into the art department and not be in visual effects. So um, in 1996, Bo Welch uh, got me in the union as an illustrator on Men in Black to um, do a lot of do graphics and um, a lot of like set illustrations on that movie. And then I ended up working with him for the next uh, three or four years. We had a nice little run of movies. Uh, it was a great launching, launching pad. <laughs> yeah. Start at the top. <laughs> yeah. And, and were you a, an art director for Bo? No, I was, a, I was a, an illustrator and um, I actually came in to the interview. I had no way to print out my work in good quality. So I came in with my 17 inch CRT up the stairs and set up my computer and showed him some of my work on the computer. And um, he hired me and got me into the union under the special skills clause. And I think I was the first illustrator in local 790 at the time to get in under special skills because of uh, computer um, computer experience. And so, yeah, it was like the, red, the beginning of the revolution, I guess, of the digital revolution. And then what was your first production uh, that you were art directed on? And then maybe your first production as a, as a, um, I ended up art directing for um, a, my second mentor, Alex McDowell, who is absolutely terrific and a real early adopter of technology. He was really, he had, I think the first like 100% uh, digital art department, but I ended up working with him. And I think my, I think my first art director credit was Transformers, not with him, um, with Jeff Mann, and then um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with Alex Alex McDowell. And I ended up working as a supervising art director a couple of times with Alex, and which was a great, another great experience and a great, an incredible opportunity to learn and to learn, you know, sort of the more um, management and diplomatic skills that we need in this job. <laughs> Yeah, there's no way to do that. I mean, you, you have to learn that as you go, I think. Um, yeah, the, you can't go to school. Uh, the politics and the, and the people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Well, I watched Air again last night. This was my third time. And and I had just thought I would sort of scan it just to see and so that I could update myself and things would be fresh. But I really got into the movie, you guys. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, Francois, I, this probably came to you first, right? This movie? Actually, no. <laughs> they, they had like... Uh like 15 minutes to prep this movie. <laughs> I got a call from my agent. This was maybe a possibility. And I, they just called me back on a Friday night and said, we made your deal. You're starting Monday. And I'm like, oh, okay. It was like a, a 30 second uh, deal. They just told me where to go. And I, uh, Kevin told me that Jan was going to be the set decorator. And I was like, oh my God, I've been wanting to work with Jan for years. We've shared emails back and forth. Um, and the timing just never quite worked out, but she was on my like wish list. <laughs> and so it was like, it was like, it was Christmas came early, basically. It was like, it was like this little present, the, the, the perfectly ready to go. It was, I didn't have to do anything. It was perfect. And then I heard from you and I was like, wow, I've always wanted to work with Francois. So <laughs> it was a gift for me. I was thrilled. And I, I think that one of the most interesting things about this project is um, what Ben wanted to do is he wanted to gather very, very experienced people from the actors to the department heads across the board. As a result of that, everyone was just at the top of their game. On this, and, and so it really was inspiring for, for us to want to keep up with that, you know. <laughs> But, but like the first time I met Ben Affleck was on Monday morning, 8 a.m. in a parking lot in Northridge with Bob Richardson and Kevin, the producer. And we were scouting day one. And he had literally gotten off the plane the night before from um, spending five hours with Michael Jordan at his golf course in Florida. So he was full of stories about the details that Michael had given him about the story. And he was just telling us about all the changes that were going to happen in the script for, to add authenticity and add a few more make pump you know a few more characters that were important to Michael and it was great and so Jen where did you begin uh, while they're out scouting to find locations or 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 maybe you couldn't do much until you had a location I don't know I mean I know that this is period and you only have a you know a very short prep time were you frightened <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes, I was terrified. We were in a little office in Glendale while Francois was out scouting. And I kept going into Kevin saying, What what are we what are we doing? How how can we do this? But Jen, um, I think we found our main set like on day yes. five or something. Yeah. yeah. Very, very quickly, uh, we found this building in the Santa Monica Business Park that was going to be the entire production. Costumes, art department, set deck, editing, everybody in this, in the two floors of this building. We took over 22,000 square feet for the set. So we actually moved in on a Friday and there was no furniture and we were sitting on the floor, I remember, where there are computers and, and, and a few fold out tables with some books and things. And I think construction started, they moved in the same day. We didn't have one drawing. So this is what we're looking at now is a is the building with a a visual effects set extension to make it look like Oregon. So it's been painted. The horizon's been painted to look more verdant. When was it decided to shoot everything as much as you can in this building? When Ben scouted it, he went on a like a thirty mile an hour walk <laughs> through the building, just sort of like talking and and oh, this could be here and this could be there. And then when he came back and did the second walkthrough, it really kind of clicked for him that he needed a C-suite. This is the C-suite upstairs with a, with a world that was more of an executive world and then a very separate bullpen downstairs. And that's it. I mean, it was very, very gut instinct in terms of like the programming of the space of where things could be. Now, of course, all of this doesn't look like 1984. It looks like 2004. <laughs> so we realized early on that everything had to be gutted. Every floor surface, every wall surface, every ceiling surface, every piece of carpet, every door, every window, everything had to be reclad. I mean, Jen did just such a phenomenal job with this, with bringing in the 80s into this world. And I love, Francois, that you changed the railings to brass. That made such a difference. Because brass and glass equals class. 
<laughs> exactly. We didn't have a lot to go from in terms of what Nike looked like. We had like these precious artifact photos that took weeks to find. And, uh, you know, there would be like a, a CBS interview or, or uh, you know, a few archival photos. But it gave us just enough information. And it really wasn't glamorous, a glamorous place. It was, it was, we wanted to paint a picture of a very sort of normal 1980s corporate culture. And the, the main business was running shoes. You know, they, there was no such thing as a basketball line. The 80s is still very popular. It, it seems to be a very um, picked over inventory in town. How did you approach going about getting the things for this movie? It was a bit daunting because, you know, we were walking through all these side offices saying, OK, well, we'll do the big bullpen out here. And then we, well, maybe we won't see into this office and maybe we won't see into that office. And we ended up seeing into every office. And all those offices off to the side had to have something in them. At least, uh, you know, we would do the minimum of a desk, a desk, a desk chair, guest chairs and art and plants. Plants helped us a lot. But we we were worried that we couldn't find enough stuff. So um, I reached out to all of our prop house friends, you know, Advanced Liquidators and and Warner Brothers and Robert said, oh, there's a show in Texas that's liquidating right now. And she, he put me in touch with the set decorator there who had this humongous warehouse. It must have been 50,000 square feet. I mean, it was huge. And she would send me videos and photographs and we would FaceTime and they would tag things. She and her lead man. And she had desks and bookcases and sets of office chairs that you see in the small conference room. They're a blue fabric with a blonde, blonde wood frame. And she had 12 of them. And that's exactly what we needed. And she had a matching conference table to go with it. One thing that um, that we really were trying to do was we were trying to break away from the same 80s chairs that you've seen all over the place and find things that were more unique. And but and but the tr the tricky thing is we had to find 10 of them. You know, we had I think three or four different conference rooms that we needed multiple chairs of. Yes. This was the hero conference room where they make the deal with with Michael Jordan. We were so lucky with the things that we found. Omega recovered these um, chrome chairs for us. And some of the desks, that, that desk, I think, is from Omega. We grabbed desks from wherever we could. This was one that came from the Texas Hall. <laughs> and this, these chairs came from Texas. They were originally upholstered in blue, and we brought them into uh, Phil Knight's color scheme. Ben was adamant, remember this, Francois, that he wanted all the computers to work. They all have to work. The way that Ben works is that he has a C camera shooting extreme close up just of the entire 22,000 square foot set. Yeah. So the thing that Jan did that I think is extraordinary with her team is that every desk is completely dressed and is able to be photographed in extreme close up, but also has a story behind the employee who is assigned to that desk. They, they all have like personality and uh, authentic detail from the company. Ben wanted the what he called "I remember that" details. Yeah. So he wanted ephemera that spoke specifically to 1984, like on every desk. And then, it, then when we did that, he wanted more. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it was. I mean, he was Ben would literally come in in the morning with his phone and be texting me like links to eBay, get this tomorrow, get this today, more, 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 more handheld game devices, more this, more that. Yeah, it was, I don't know how you did it, Jan. It's incredible. Uh, great team. I would sort through the smalls that we brought and we just brought tons of smalls and the the gang would just grab things and, and I'd say, okay, everybody has a theme, you know, give everybody a personality. And they were really great about doing it. It was terrific. And of course, Joni Andersky, my assistant, was unbelievable. And, and she would, she was re ready to bite my head off a couple of times because I would say, 
I need more desks. I need more desks. How can you need more desks? You've got them all. (laughs) Have every desk in town. How could you need more? And there were so many things that Ben remembered from his childhood that are so copyright protected that we were terrified to get them. And then finally, in the end, he was like, I just want them. <laughs> yeah, he, he, we put stuff in there that they decided to deal with and figure out later. It, yeah. it was, uh, and he was he said, I'll take full responsibility. Just put it in and we'll deal with it later. If we see yeah. it, we'll, we'll pay and we'll make it work. Yeah. But it's stuff that we've always shied away from over the years. It's like you, know, you can never use Garfield and you can never use the eight ball and you can never, you know, all those things, the Rubik's cube. Oh my God. Clearance people would bite our heads off. And he was like, I want it in there. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, sir. (laughs) Whatever you say. (laughs) What I noticed last night when I looked at the movie is that uh, you see a lot of the set in the credits. The uh, opening scene is basically these shots of, of commercials and, and clips from movies intercut with scenes of the set and extras in the set. It's a really extraordinary thing because it makes it feel like you're you're just transitioning from things that you specifically remember about 1984, and then it dissolves into Nike in 1984. And it's it it, it sort of like hypnotizes you back into 1984 as a result of that like method to to enter the movie. Whenever there was something there was a minute waiting for an actor or waiting for something. They would pick up the C camera and 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 shoot these inserts on on many different formats on video and on on sixty millimeter on um, old CCT cameras and things. Which meant that the whole place had to be lit, which was a whole other fun project. <laughs> well, and I and I know from personal experience being there is that everything was indeed ready to be shot. And, and and there was no skimping at all. Um, mm-hmm. I know I tagged over like 125 pieces of art for you, <laughs> just as you know, which a lot was just sort of background dressing and never, ever featured. And um, we ran out. <laughs> <laughs> we could have used 125 more. Exactly. Phil, Phil Knight had uh, gone to Japan and spent some time as a young man in Japan and was really enamored with the culture and uh, the furniture and, and actually had brought some of that influence back to the decor of his first offices. And so that was a thread that Jan like interwove with the different spaces, some oriental uh, uh, touches and furnitures. So there are like little smatterings of, of, uh, of, of Japanese and Asian influences. This was a lot of fun doing all of this detail, which had to be, specifically perfect for Phil Knight's character. Every book had something to say about scholarly corporate books that a CEO would have in the 1980s, you know. Then all of this ephemera from Nike. Do you want to talk about that, Jen? Because that was absolutely incredible. Oh my God. So originally, Phil Knight and Bowerman started out selling sneakers out of yeah. the back of a van. It was called Blue Ribbon Sports you know, and a little receipt that we made up that was Blue Ribbon Sports. Um, Bowerman developed this special soul by looking at his wife's waffle iron and pouring a rubber in there and figuring out that that had actually great traction. So we had some of those original shoes, but we also had the original waffle iron that he used, you know, that, that exact style. and then. We were. I was buying a bunch of posters on eBay one day for Nike posters from the '80s, and finally the guy reached out to me and said, "Hey, you might want to talk to my buddy. His name is Jordy. He's got a Nike museum. He had it in Vegas, and now he's closed it, but he still has the whole collection." And at the same time, our producer came down and talked to us, and said. Hey, I've got this buddy that I went to school with. His name yeah, is Jordy. Jordy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it turned out to be the same guy. So I got his contact information from our producer, reached out to him, and he had all these amazing original and some prototype sneakers. Like he had the prototype of the sneaker that Nike developed for Prefontaine when he was going to run in the Olympics and he passed away before he could wear them. So he had this unused, amazing 
One of a kind. Two, one of a kind that he literally carried down on a plane. We flew him down with some special ones. And every night, all the ones that were in Phil Knight's office and all the little Nike ephemera that he brought us, we would we bought this special cage and we locked them up every night. But the this that white shoe is a prototype shoe that they were gonna do for um Golfing, I think, Francois, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, it's either golfing or track and field. I don't remember either. Something, one of those, yeah. But each of these shoes had a story that was behind it. But it was just, a, you know, these gifts that you get, that, like the, the set dressing gods are, are looking out for us. The crazy thing is, is that this normally would take a long time. <laughs> but we had this ticking clock. And so some of this stuff was coming in at the last minute. Meanwhile, you've got Ben who wanted to get ahead and of schedule and he wanted to shoot a little bit in the office two days early or something. And we were like, well, we're not going to be ready with we don't have all this ephemery in, the, in, the, in all of these shelves yet. We don't have the shoes. And he's like, don't worry, I'll just be shooting out the windows. Well, I get this call from set. Uh, they want you on set. And I go in and Bob Richardson's going like this <laughs> and they've turned the camera around and they're pointing at the back wall that doesn't that's not dressed yet and i called Shannon. <laughs> and she and i'm like you better come up here because they want to shoot uh they want to sh- the, the the weather's bad they can't shoot out the windows and they want to shoot towards the this part of the set that's not finished and literally the final dressing had just arrived i think that morning and she had just we literally wheeled the cart into the room and steam was coming out of her ears. <laughs> Everybody was terrified of Jan when she was like, they're back. Everyone was backing the whole crew's like backing it. <laughs> and she's like, so we, she was literally dressing the set with the camera, you know, everybody waiting. And all uh, the eyes boring into us. Yeah, it was great. It was Absolutely. Wonder, it's wonderful. wonderful coming in with the troops. Yeah. 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 So much time to stand back and say, "Oh, hmm, what do you think?" <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Well, well, I I, I wrote down uh, on something like this: you have to trust your instincts, and you have to, you know, you go, you get this gut feeling about something, and you just do. You 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 you. But I also know for a fact that both of you guys were there at, with your crews much later, trying to you know get one tiny little bit of a step ahead. I, I think that's exactly right. I think um, we had longer hours in the art de- in our department uh, and set deck than I think the shooting crew for sure. Yeah, definitely. Redoing a building from the literally from the floor up, and then they would start looking out a window, and we'd have to call and get more blinds, more vertical blinds, to match the rest of the of the building, and so we were getting like you know eight windows at a time. And, oh my God, we need more. And I'd call Bruce Wang and say, okay, Bruce, I need, you know, I need 20 more. I'm going to fax you. I'm going to email you the the sizes. And again, I think there's something to be said about the purity of gut instincts. You can only have that confidence after getting some gray hair, I guess, you know, (laughs) and and knowing it's going to be okay. And it was really a team effort. We were all in the same space together and everybody, we were doing projects together, cutting and gluing and framing in the art department. It was the most collaborative experience I've ever had between set deck and the art department, all in a family environment, really helping and supporting each other. It was really remarkable. And Anthony Syracuse and his team, and and they were constantly they would they would go to Francois and see what he needed, and then they would come to me and say, "Okay, so we need to do this, and how much time do you need here? And we can give yeah. you part of this." And you know, they they're just such an amazing, well oiled machine. I had a I had a long relationship with my supervising art director, A. Todd Holland, and my other art director, Katrina, and I just trusted them completely. And they knowing that they could decide on a lot of things and just let me know. And the only way that this works is if you can make decisions very, very quickly. You can't you can't do this kind of schedule and be like, let me get back to you tomorrow. Let's we'll decide. Yeah. Friday, how long do we have? You have to just make these decisions in the moment and with confidence. Remember this set was at LA North Studios? Yeah, we were, this was going to be a a full day of shooting downtown at the LA Times building. And then 
I think it was nine days before shooting, maybe nine or 10 days before shooting, Kevin comes into my office at 8 a.m. and goes, I didn't want to bother you over the weekend, but we're going to do this on stage now. And uh, we just uh, we want you to kind of copy what we were going to do at, at the L.A. Times, but build it on stage. And I go, is it are you thinking about shooting it the same day, Kevin? He's like, yeah, <laughs> that's like in nine days. Uh huh. OK. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> that's what we did. The conference room was known for its round table, but they had gotten rid of it. So we had to have this constructed. And Anthony is uh, one of the many things I love about him is that he's honest when he says he he's too buried and he can't do it. So rather than not achieve it properly, he will say, you need to go outside for that. So we had this built by someone that was recommended to us from Warner Brothers uh, because their shop couldn't do it. I mean, it was a, it was at a really busy time in town. And then Warner Brothers paint shop did the staining of it. Those drapes nearly, nearly did us in. Ben wanted a screen to automatically, the projector screen to automatically lower or raise. I can't remember now which one. And then the drapes mm -hmm. automatically open. And they're not made to do that. You know, so we're trying to, we're talking to effects about motors and it was insane, but eventually it all sort of somehow came together in the movie. It looks great, but it, this was, this was a cause of many gray hairs. And then <laughs> the Adidas. So the two sets were being built in those same nine days and they were, neither one was a simple set. This was one of my favorite sets. I, I, I mean, Jen and your team did such a beautiful job on this because it's also, this is a conference room, but also kind of a museum, again, with all of this history of Adidas in these uh, bespoke cases. And then Ben was really inspired by some of the reference that we found in Germany, and, and, and we made this like nine foot tall uh, shot putter. David was online looking for vintage Adidas sneakers for us because we didn't have a, a Geordie for Adidas and Converse. And, and I remember uh, we bought the posters too, some of the posters and days. Um, th those chairs in the conference room, that was that, that quite a score for the Adidas chairs. Oh my God. Joni found those at NoHo Modern. Amazing and chairs. He had he had just gotten one and he put that that color on just as a lark. And we fell in love with it. And that he had 12 of them. <laughs> If there's an award for chairs, Jan should get an award for chairs because I, I kept going like we can't have just America. We can't have Eames and just like the same old chairs that you see in all these movies. And these chairs, I had never seen chairs like this before. I thought they were so unique. Me either. And, you know, Jan is so enthusiastic. She has this infectious enthusiasm that spreads to everyone in her department. So like. When Joni kept found these chairs, she'd come in wide-eyed. <laughs> I found these chairs, and everyone like stops what they're doing. I gotta go. I gotta go. Hang up the phone. Like where we're what? You know, it's like this. It's, it's uh, again it's, back to trusting your instincts or knowing when things are right. You know, right. Um, and I always feel that somehow, you know, the, the universe makes this happen for us. It's unbelievable time schedule. And if you really think about it, you're going to say, "I don't want to do this because I can't pull this off in this way." <laughs> Time. But of course, there you are. And there was a problem also with the uh, uh, Nike boardroom, wasn't there? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, yeah. that's a funny story because uh, we had I had designed and illustrated the Nike conference room to be a little bit more uh, in keeping with the rest of the space and a, a lighter color scheme. And it was going to shoot on a Thursday. On Monday... Ben comes up to me and goes, he hadn't seen the set, but it was basically finished. And he comes in to, during shooting and goes, you know, I was thinking over the weekend, the Nike boardroom should be wood paneling, don't you think? And I go, why do you think that? And he goes, well, it just feels right. It just feels, I mean, wood dark wood paneling, dark wood paneling. And I go, shoot, when do you need that? For Thursday? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I mean, you can go to... Anyway, you can go to Home Depot or something and get some wood. <laughs> and so we changed the whole color scheme, uh, sort of uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It turned out great. 
but um, it was kind of a last minute pivot. And Adrian Valdez was the lead scenic painter and was able to pull it off. Uh, it was a nail biter for sure, though. Oh, and one of my favorite things about this room was this three color vintage 1983 projector that we found on Craigslist or eBay or something locally. And it worked. It had the original remote and everything. And it was practical in the shot. They were watching a video and it, and just an extraordinary thing, but it weighed like <laughs> 9,000 pounds. <laughs> so that was, that was fun, right? Yeah. And we didn't get it in time for Steve Irwin to test it for syncopation, oh, which was insane. Um, so he had to test it while we were trying to figure out how to install this beast to the ceiling. You know what the funny thing was? I, we, we had a screening and I actually met the man that we bought that from. He came to the screening. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. I can't believe we found that. Oh, my God. It was insane. One of my really favorite sets in the movie is David Fox. I, I, I am crazy about that office. I'm uh, so right for the period. It's just wonderful. It, thanks. It really worked. And you found those fabulous gray drapes that just fit the windows perfectly, which was a, another gift from the universe. But you know what was my favorite set is the shoe lab. I really love the shoe lab a lot, too, because there's a side of it that's traditional with these forms that that Jan made. These are all famous uh, athletes that had their sh their feet molded. That's the idea. And then they would make prototypes over the actual forms. And there was a lot of authentic sort of detailing about the trade of being a cobbler, right? And then on the other side of the room, there's a lot of futuristic science. And so it's really like the space is about the past and the future, the past and the present and the future. It's very metaphoric in that way. But my favorite part of this was this uh, light table that's in the middle of the space. I don't know where you found that, but it's really like the anchor in the middle of the room. Joni found that on eBay for $350. Or uh, no, it was on uh, Craigslist. And I forget where it was. It was somewhere in Kansas. And I'm like, Joni, how are we going to get it from Kansas? But it was so perfect. And it had to come up the stairs, right? It had to come up the stairs. What was kind of a, an unexpected gift was it, it, it was lit up during the scene. Bob Richardson lit it up. And it created like, it reminded me of this cauldron, like the cauldron in the beginning of Macbeth with the witches, you know, where the witches are looking around the cauldron, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. It, it's, it felt like there was magic that was happening in the shoe lab. Like there was this moment in time of conjuring up the Air Jordan from, from this cauldron. And I thought that metaphorically, it really like sung. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. That was so much fun. We were we were trying to find one. And I knew that there had been one that I had gotten from I used it some I don't even remember what show I used it in, but I remember that it was at it was at Fitum and I bought it from them. We used it and then I don't know what happened to it. We couldn't track it down. And when Joni found this, it was just I love this scene. I just I love this. This is truly, I agree with you. It's it, it is that conjuring feeling and it, it just made it so special i think and they all used the space really well uh they linked you know walking around and and using the dressing as pieces to underscore their dialogue it was really like a testament to their oh. experience to to make it all feel real w within the performances Usually, usually a movie comes out and you're like, nah, you didn't see that. You didn't see this. They saw, we saw everything. And he would have wanted more if we could have given him more. This is my amazing crew. They actually looked up basketball players from that era and they put the real names on the shoe lasts. So they are just, I, uh, hats off to them. They also did that with the videotapes between Katrina and our team. They looked up draft picks that were from that era. And those are all real, you know, I should probably shouldn't say they're real names, but they really are. But that's how authentic everybody wanted to be. You know, everybody jumped on board with that. How many videotapes, Jan, did we do? I think it was about 2,000. 
They were all real. They were all real labels. <laughs> real labels. Um, and some were the masking tape labels and some were the, the ones that used to come with the videotapes. And, and where do you buy 2,000 videotapes? Oh, some, you know, dozen by dozen and hundred by hundred. And some of them were three pack by three pack. But it was just, it was insane. Well, so much goes into it. It's really terrific. Um, the Jordan Kitchen, uh, uh, was it always planned to be a little too all set? I know that you don't know that if you're watching the movie, but I, uh, being there and in person, I knew that it was a two wall set. No, it had always been planned to be on stage or on, in our office. <laughs> we ended up using every single square inch of this building. And this was literally the only empty space upstairs in the mezzanine that we could find to put this set together. And Ben had this brilliant idea that all he wanted all the telephone calls in the movie to be real, meaning anytime someone's on the phone in the movie, they're having a real conversation through the phone to the actor in the other set. So Viola Davis is doing this performance in her kitchen and Matt Damon is downstairs in his office on the other side of the conversation for real. And um, J.P. Jones, our uh, incredible prop master, would actually run old telephone line, sometimes out to the parking lot to a phone booth. And, and so he, could, and he set up a switchboard so all these characters could actually have a, a phone call and, and then Ben could get the coverage of it real. Usually what happens is that you have the script supervisor do the other side of the phone call. These were actually real. And I think it was a, a genius idea. It is a genius idea. Ben is really into that sort of thing. I mean, when we did Argo, he was it was the same. All the phones were live. We had a whole switchboard system. But this set, that stained glass window was my favorite thing. I found that at the Long Beach Swap Meet. And I wasn't sure what to do with it, but I knew that it had to be in her set somewhere. She was very religious the family the jordan family was very religious so i wanted to just work it in but but i wanted to be a little bit subtle about it <laughs> not that that's subtle but but i was so happy with how it worked out it fit into the set one thing i love about you jan is that you love talking about backstory and you love talking about all of these little details with the family and some of it's inspired by research. And we talk about what kind of woman she must have been. You know, she works at a bank, how many kids, how old are the kids? And we just keep talking and talking and talking and talking about all these little details and about ways to sort of pepper those things into the set and just makes it feel so real. Thank you. I, I, that's the fun part to me is we, we are the storytellers, you know, I mean, the actors are really telling the story, but we need to support them without overshadowing them. And so whatever we can do to make it look real, I'm all in. I, I just, I love that part of what we get to do. Oh my God, David. David helped with the 7-Eleven. Oh my God. I think this was Ben's favorite set, Ben and Matt, because we took over an actual 7-Eleven in, um, where was it, in the Valley? Deep in the Valley, yes. Yeah, and 7-Eleven allowed us to change everything in their store. So it had a lot of the 80s bones with the tile floor and everything, but everything got, uh, it was a massive dress for you guys. My God, this was a lot of detail. I know. Thank you, David. <laughs> and his <laughs> for hire and Lenny Marvin and and your Slurpee machine, David. The Slurpee machine worked. The Slurpee machine all worked. <laughs> everything worked. The coffee machines worked. And there was a lot of really neat detail in here. Yeah, I remember that distinctly. And Jen, also, you you had found some uh, period 7-Eleven cups, right? For the, yes. for the Yeah. But, but a small quantity. Yep. So they were like gold. We had to really hold on to those. And then those damped cereal boxes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We bought a bunch of cereal boxes. And then I became, you know, on eBay, you become friends with these people and they start sending you other stuff like, hey, maybe you'd like these cereal boxes. So, yeah, 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 we'll take them. Um, and then we we had to make some with graphics and all the magazines that we bought and we were able to use. But Francois, you did a, uh, your crew did an amazing amount of printing of graphics that got used in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jason Kareen uh, was the art director on this. He's incredible graphic designer and they were and he was just brought on just for the 7-Eleven. The other sets were done 
mostly by Zach Fannin, who I've known for years, who did an incredible job. But um, yeah, lots of graphics. Christina Mile came in to help us. Yeah, so we had three graphic designers on almost for the run of the whole show. He did an amazing job at 7-Eleven, I have to say. That was really cool. We used some of the some of the bread that I made for um Suburbicon and had given to given to History for Hire at the end of Suburbicon. And here we go with the original recyclers, right? 7-Eleven gave you permission, but they they didn't offer much to us, right? They trucker hats, that was it. <laughs> They had nothing. They kept nothing from their history. And and I kept saying, but David, we need we need a slurpy machine. <laughs> you have to find something. But that guy was amazing. He, he was terrific. He was just terrific. Uh, and, you know, and he was a, a guy who does uh, parties uh, as and, and frozen margaritas. And uh, yeah, he, I can do a blue. <laughs> I, I can do non-alcoholic. I can do blue and I can do red, you know. He's so. since come to my house twice with that machine with the margarita <laughs> mix, I have to just say. <laughs> We're old friends now. <laughs> Excellent. And and the graphics really sold it. I, I, I know that several people have asked you if it was a real Slurpee machine. So I, I think we got away with it, which was terrific. Yeah. And Francois, what about the exterior of the building? Isn't that an all-new 7-Eleven? Yeah, we redid the sign, um, yeah. put vinyl graphics on the window, and we even... I, I was trying to think about how to make it Beaverton. So we brought in some wood. I think there were like a couple cords of uh, wood out there. Yeah, again, you know, it takes like, you know, a couple of days to dress it or three days to, you know, by the time you get in and start to move out and then you start to dress. And then, of course, they shoot it in one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like cooking a meal, you know, it always takes longer to cook the meal than eat it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. A great way to put it. That's true. That makes me feel a little better. <laughs> so should we say that we actually only had the four weeks to prep it? <laughs> and that it was shot in 23 days that we swore we wouldn't tell. But I know. Well, Francois and, and, and the interview with Charlize mentioned that they she said, I'm not going to let too many people know that we only had five weeks of prep. <laughs> and like, oh, my God. I think I, had, I think I had six weeks and you had five. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. But you know what? I, I actually am very proud about that. And I and I'm very proud of the fact that we made a movie of this quality in Los Angeles in, in um for a number in a in a in a inefficiently because it is a film business and they don't make movies like this very much. And they don't make them in LA very much. And they certainly don't make it without the California rebate. This didn't have the California rebate. So the fact that we were able to be efficient and do it quickly is a real success story, I think. And it shows that it can be done and uh, you can make movies this way. You, it, there's just there's not just one way of making a movie. There's there's different ways to make a movie. And our jobs is to show what that version is, what we can do within the resources, right? And do the best that we can. Yeah. And I think that's the great thing about artist equity. They really want to promote that, that you can do it this way. I mean, I hope they... Add, add another few add weeks. Another three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I also am very proud of this. I think it's, and honestly, I've gotten more notes from colleagues that about this movie than almost any other movie I've ever done. It's quite. Well, I, I think that our colleagues and uh, people who do this know that it's, respect how difficult it is. <laughs> it's difficult to make a movie about people in offices, talking in offices, interesting, visually interesting. It's And it's also vi difficult to make a movie set in the 80s not cliched or not distracting. And I think that, Jan, I mean, you did such an amazing job just making it feel, just making it wash over you and not, Thanks. and and stay authentic and, and real and pure, you know? Thank you. That was That was the hope. That was the hope. And, and when I when I was like watching the movie last night again, you see the pictures at the end and and what has happened to people and uh, or what happened to people and how much money Michael Jordan has made. But there's this this whole shot of of um, you know uh, Ben Affleck and then it fades into Phil Knight and just how close you really are to what was there. It's really incredible. That was one of the two photos we had fuzzy photos of his of his office, right? That's why I think in that photo, 
Jen tracked down the Kleenex box, the glass tea mug, the computer, the keyboard, these photos, they were so rare, they became artifacts. And we would, with our magnifying glasses, we just, it was a labor of love to literally try to recreate every single um, piece of reality that we could find about Nike in 1984. We were on a mission. <laughs> well, it pays off, really, really incredible. I, I just wanted to say one thing about one set that didn't get shot very much, but that was the solarium, the little courtyard, I thought was really terrific. It was all created. When we moved into this off office, it was all covered in California palms. And we uh, took out all of the greens that were there. Ben wa wanted it to be, I think he'd use the term shitty. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> want it to, to be too. It, so I had to feel, it, he said, 80s and also not too lush or rich. So we, we used like less glamorous types of plants that felt corporate. Um, and then the inner fountain, these are foam uh, blocks of stone that um, we sculpted and painted. And we had a little bubbling, a kind of, I wanted it to be a sad, a sad fountain. <laughs> so it just kind of like gurgles. It's like the area you go and there's men smoking and with cigarette butts, butts on the floor. I did this little sketch. <laughs> it's it's a funny space. And then all of the, all of the, um, the walls were clad in vinyl Ugh. so that it, to give it like that weathered sort of sad, uh, rain, dirty rainwater look. I forgot about that, that that had to happen too, before they could even do the greens work. Oh my God. There was so much work. Well, it must've been like, we're going to be here from seven to two. You can have it from one thirty to four thirty, and then somebody else can have it to overnight to do the floor, you know? Yeah, it was synchronized swimming for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, really incredible work. Thank you. Uh, and and I think you know, you know talking about this kind of movie, um, there's a real market, you know, for for a good story and well done. And and you know, it used to be like those, those thirty million dollar movies that all disappeared. But um, you know, this is. I hope that they they can continue. This company, the Artist Equity, can continue original stories that aren't sequels or remakes or oh, based on existing great. IP. Yes, won't that be great? <laughs> I think that's their goal. So it's pretty it's pretty lofty, and I hope they're they give it a good go. All right. So Jen, your absolute favorite part of the show, of doing this movie? Oh my god! You know, I think it was working with this team, Francois and everybody, it was just, it really was like a family and we all just tackled it in the, the best way possible. And we all put our heads together. And I think, I think more than the result of it, I think the communal feeling of it all was just great. Mm -hmm. Everybody was on board and, and it was just, you know, as hard as it was, it was a warm and fuzzy feeling the, the whole, the whole time. And I just, I cherished that. There was this real family feeling of um, of being supportive in any way possible, and 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 all being in it together, um, and that's what I remember about the experience. Yeah, same here. And and, and, and first of all, do you know um, how long were each of the second units? Just a day or two of shooting. It was like a day or two in each state. I think it was, but it really helped a lot when that was sutured together with in the editing. It really helped make it feel real. That's how we used to make movies, all based in L.A. with a second unit or like part of the crew going away at the end of the schedule to go shoot period stuff that you can't create in L.A. and then cutting it together. And it still works as, a, as, a, as an approach. It brings me to the exterior of the Jordan house. That sequence is very effective and very clever because you never you would never know it was done in Northridge. And what it is, is there's interior photography inside the car with Matt, green screen, where they put in plates of Georgia in the background cut to a body double of him driving down the street in Georgia uh, to cut to him going, walking out of his car with a body double and then cutting right to our set in Northridge. And then in the back um, there's uh, there in the dialogue, we talk about the big trees. And so there's one shot that, that tilts down from a plate of giant um, cedars or whatever 
that's very very effective and 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 with the sound i thought the sound design was incredible too it sound you can hear the cicadas and stuff in the trees um but yeah it's really one visual effect shot in that whole sequence that sells the whole thing yeah absolutely um and and did, did you know that that was going to how much of that was going to happen when you were yeah it was very well planned out that was the plan from the very beginning i actually scouted the trees that we were going to photograph to put into the plate uh, and second unit went and photographed the trees to put in uh, beyond the, the fence. The backyard had like 80 feet of giant bamboo. We had to take out, cut down and we built it, built, we surrounded the fence with, we, we surrounded the backyard with fencing and tons of grains. And then uh, it was always planned to comp in additional trees beyond the fence in one direction. It looked real uh, as far as the greens and the uh, topography goes. You know, it was just pretty amazing. So, again, I can't, I've said congratulations about three times or four times or whatever. But I think this film is really lovely. And I think both of you did an amazing job. Just incredible. Thank you, David. And thank you for your participation and support and help. I and mean, you were right there in the trenches with us. And again, we couldn't have done any of this without our team. And it was like it really was a family affair and very, very grateful. It was a great team. I'm, we're so proud of. I'm so proud of this movie, and it was fun to work with you and and the whole team. It was great. Well, we got to do it again. We got to do okay. it again with more weeks of prep. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Even just a few. <laughs> well, I'm on board. Okay. Right. Thanks, David. Thank, Thank you, you David. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.